Nice one. Hi, Tia. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Brian. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So excited. Uh, so I'm so excited for this conversation. Um, um, I've been really looking forward to it, to it all day and make, uh, we'll see where, where things go. Um, I did have an initial question I wanted to ask you, Tia. Um, and it's about this concept or this idea or this feeling of passion or uh, maybe absorption or like feeling in the flow. Um, these are things that uh, we've been discussing on the podcast and kind of in our group a lot recently um, as, as kind of like a goal for people to rediscover. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what I've been curious about asking guests is if they would be willing to reflect back on their stories a little bit on their biographies and try to think back to maybe young adult hood or even adolescence and if you can remember any activities or subjects that really you felt absorbed absorbed in or, or you felt that were really gripping um do you, do you remember anything like that um from back in your story that is a great story i think or question i think um so it, during adolescence i was really uh passionate about sports nice so I loved uh, particularly softball hmm. um, and basketball, but softball is really where I felt like when you're talking about being in the flow, mm -hmm. I felt like it just was like second nature to me. Um, and then I've always been kind of like crafty, I guess. Oh, cool. Like, you know, paper and ribbons and what can I create or what can I sew? So those are the two things that would stand out from adolescence about like passion. That's really fun. Uh, both the, the sports one and the, the craft, the crafts. Um, I've been really intrigued that sports is coming up a lot uh, for folks. That's, that's really cool. I, I was an athlete too. And I wonder what you think. And, and there might be something with the crafts and art too that that's here as well. I'm wondering if you think, just thinking back on, on why, because now, we can definitely still play sports, but we all have different things we're, we're doing and it might not be an option for everyone. Mm -hmm. Just try reflecting back on those lessons. I wonder what you think about this. Something I've loved about sports is the inner interplay between structure and surprise. Mm. And so sports are very structured, right? There's a game, it's very clear what the rules are. You can push up against the edge, but then there's a boundary there and it, there's a lot of clarity. But within that structure, there's so many fun little surprises that happens. The underdog wins or the person it, uh, batting last hits a home run and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so fun. Um, it, it, so there's some certainty and su surprise. And I don't know, for me that I, I'm really playing with that, that idea. Do you think that's one, one, one thing you enjoyed about sports or what do you think uh, was kind of driving you to be so passionate in it? You know, I really have not thought about that um, like this. So I appreciate this question. Yeah. Yes, I am sure that's part of it. And I, I'll share even now um, when you're talking about like the, the structure and the surprise. So right now I'm volunteering to coach uh, my daughter's basketball oh. team. Cool. And we are not the we're not the best team okay. <laughs> we're, we're actually we're actually ranked last okay. out of all teams <laughs> and the surprise part so um a game a couple of weeks ago we were we were losing pretty bad and the girls were getting really down and I was like do you think we can we had zero at this point and the other team had like 28 points mm. and I said do you think we can get any points and they were mm. like yeah i said okay how many do you think we can get two this is the girls we can get two. <laughs> nice. great do you think we can get four and they were like mm, nah, right. that was not probably going to happen so they went back out on the court and scored two points and when i tell you those two points were like the best two points in the history of basketball. It was like, they all lit up, they all jumped and like, especially, um, you know, the girl who made the shot, like her face just lit up and it just changed. I mean, we're, we were still losing, but it really changed everything as far as like their demeanor and how they were feeling. And so I, you know, I think you um, bring up something that um, is very true. And I think if I'm reflecting back on my own adolescence for me it was probably also having a like the sense of community 
around mm -hmm. and competitiveness because I noticed um, I ran track for a while, um, but after my freshman year of high school, I stopped because my nerves were so, so bad. Like my, I would get sick before running a race and, and I just really flourished when I had a, a team around me, so. Oh, that is that I think that's a that's a pretty uh, uh, great great point you're making there Tia about the team and the community and like the fellowship, mm -hmm. especially as we start maybe transitioning to talking about uh, contemplative practice meditation spirituality, it can seem like that sometimes that how how these practices are present presented to me they can be very solitary and there might be an image of being alone. Uh, in a mountain or something, which sounds nice uh, sometimes, but uh, I was reading that even, you know, some of those uh, folks who did that, um, who do that in like, let's say Tibet or, or in the East, there's this beautiful relationship between townspeople who come up and like give them food. Um, and, there, and there's actually a very tight, close relationship, even in those solitary retreats. And, mm -hmm. and that really opened, opened my mind a lot um, to this idea of community. But yeah, I think that's a really fascinating point to double click on is the importance of community and fellowship and spiritual practice and how like sports is like a great expression of that or it's a, yeah. it's like a little microcosm. <clears throat> yeah, and I never really made that connection until this discussion because that's very true when you come to a practice like centering prayer, um, which of course is something that I, well, I guess technically it's not called a practice. It's the method of centering prayer for sure. Uh, you know, uh, but um, you know, you can come to that alone and also people often sit in circles. So there's that group setting. Um, so in sports, there is that correlation of even though you may be surrounded by a team of, you know, five or nine players, there is still that individual um, element that, is connected to the whole so um, cool. yeah thank you for that yeah absolutely thank you for for unpacking it a little and so you brought up the method of centering prayer and that's kind of how i discovered your work i definitely do want to like at circle back to that maybe some of the details the difference between a method and a practice that sounds fascinating uh but before we get to that i'm, I'm curious there you know uh from tia playing softball to the discovery of um, the method of centering prayer uh, I'm not quite sure about this, but I imagine there's uh, there's a gap between 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 us. Um, is that is that that's that's correct, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Good one. Good one. Uh, there is a big gap and a lot of life in yeah. between those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering if we could just staying on this bi biography piece for for a second. I'm just really curious to connect with you uh, on that on that. Um, are there any, like, if you think about that gap um, between uh, adolescence and the discovery of centering prayer, are there any like stepping stones or milestones um, on your journey, like kind of looking back now that, they, that, that seem like salient or se seem important? Um, maybe like emotion, uh, physical, um, relational, spiritual, um, any kind of uh, uh, little, little biography that we could we could we could talk about especially with this idea of stepping stones you do you, yeah. do you do you do you notice any big milestones in your life that you'd be willing to talk about absolutely i cool. the the first thing that comes up for me when you ask that question um is connected to like spirituality in my childhood home mm -hmm. and religion mm -hmm. um so i was not raised in a, a religious setting uh, so to speak, or, um, you know, we didn't, we weren't getting up and, and going to church every Sunday. Um, there wasn't a denomination that, you know, uh, I was necessarily introduced to other than um, my mom, who was raised Catholic, and my grandmother on my father's side, who uh, was Baptist. And when I'm thinking about the things that, uh, really stood out to me. It's a conversation with my mom when I was very young because a lot of my friends were going to church and uh, you know, the, the, some of our family was going to church and so I was asking questions about those things. And what I remember getting from my mom's response is that there were some things within um, how she was raised and the, um, the Catholic, um, mm -hmm. A kind of set of beliefs that she did not 
necessarily agree with. And she said, uh, and I remember this very clearly, she said, I want you to be able to choose for yourself. Hmm. And so what that did was give me a lot of freedom. And also, it also connected me to this idea of, of, of spirit, right? Like I, I believed in God, I believed in a higher power. Um, and we said prayers and things like that. But um, I think what she was helping to cultivate was this idea of like, I could explore what that relationship with God looks like on my own, that it wasn't something that had to be handed to me. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing that comes to mind is uh, really a couple of really dark periods. Um, one in like my junior and senior year in high school um, where there was a addiction and abuse going on in my home, um, which resulted in me actually having to leave home i'm sorry if you hear our dog that's okay oh that's all good she's having a little her, her breathing um but that resulted in me ultimately you know uh finishing up high school living with a friend mm -hmm. um and so there have been these couple of dark periods in my life where i felt so alone and so far from God and questioning like, you know, if there is a God, then, then why are these things like happening in my life? And um, at one of the lowest of the low points, I just, I just was in a room and I just was like, help me, like help me. And just, you know, hands in the air, like total, um, surrender. And it was at that moment that I felt um, the most seen, the most heard, the most loved, the most held um, that I had ever felt in my life. And, uh, you know, I was the only person um, in the room. So that experience really changed things for me. And, um, and I lean back on that now, I, I haven't had as dark of times Mm -hmm. um, since then, but I, I do lean back on that when things get a little rough and I remember that moment and I know that, that it's an eternal moment, right? Like, it, wow. yeah. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for, for sharing, uh, going back and, and exploring those experiences with us. Um, the, the first one really jumps out, jumps out to me about this uh, memorable conversation with your mom about, you know, there's people around you going to church. It's a confusing time. Uh, what kind of where we, 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 where do we fit in in the spiritual yeah. conversation? It seems like she kind of opened a kind of for freedom and also a, a for more of a first person experience of God. It's, it's not as external, like these are the things we're going to believe because that's what the community does. It, is that right? Am I tracking that? It was kind of an invitation to experience spirituality or the divine in a, in a first person way. Yeah, she really, I mean, I'm sure there's some things like, uh, of course, we all have our, our human experience. So I'm sure there's some things that I picked up and that influenced me. Right. But there was nothing that was handed to me, you know, so uh, that I was consciously aware of. So as I was seeing like, um, you know, friends going through certain things like a first communion or co communion in general, you know, these were all kind of things that were like foreign to me um, that I, that I had to, I call it learning backwards. Like mm. when people start talking about um, like specific religions or denominations, especially within Christianity, I'm like, okay, well tell me more because I really don't know much <laughs> when it comes yeah. to that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it honestly reminds me a, a little of my mom. What my mom did for us is she's mm -hmm. extremely spiritual, and but she's also very pluralistic. And she would just take us like it was almost like a buffet, like week by week, we would go to I went to Mormon churches, all kinds of Christian churches, synagogues, um, we exp experienced some Islam. I, I would describe mm -hmm. her as maybe like new age. I hope she's okay with, with me saying that. <laughs> she's been, uh, ex extremely into just the spirit, just the experience of, of yeah. the spirit. And, and 
And that I think is very, very liber liberating. It was very liberating and gave me a lot of freedom. And then I also now I'm also really fascinated about, you know, very fine distinctions people are making. I find that intellectually stimulating. And, um, but I do see a, a kind of connection if I can make it uh, uh, between there's, we share uh, something at the heart, at the level of the heart, a, a, a goal or a spirituality. And I, I, I don't know if that's been your experience as well as you're exploring uh, different, different faiths and different uh, practice communities. Yeah. Um, there are really cool intellectual distinctions and, that are beautiful and to be celebrated and, and, and studied. But there, it does seem that, that I find it uh, easy to connect with people on a heart level, no matter where they're coming from. Absolutely. Nice one. Nice one. Cool. Um, and also, I just wanted to say thanks for sharing about the um, challenges you had as well. And maybe go a little deeper into that um, exper experience of s surrender. And I, that jumped out, jumped out to me. Um, it seems like there's a bit of an intersection. There can be a bit of a roads taken or not taken in these experiences of despair and hopelessness, seeming hopelessness. It seems like you, um, this experience for you, uh, deep deepened your, your spirituality. And you, you I was hearing that there was a key part of that was surrender. And so yeah. I've heard that word before, and I think many of us have, but I wonder if you could talk about what your experience of surrender is um, from a spiritual perspective. Sure. And at the time, I didn't know I was surrendering. I just <laughs> knew, like, my life was not in a good place. And, you know, I wanted things to change, and I didn't know how to change them. And so now, you know, it, kind of with all of the life lived since then and knowing what I know, um, surrender is something that we're invited to, you know, moment by moment, it, you know, um, there's very little that that we can control um, in our day to day. And so it, as a spiritual practice, letting go, to me is really a place where there's um, an opening uh, where we become open to a, a variety of possibilities that we have not been aware of before, um, so to speak. So, you know, specifically when it comes to um, like centering prayer or the welcoming prayer, um, surrender is sometimes like a, a counterintuitive like a, a, a going into the deepest part of the emotion as a way to let it go would be how it's connected to, um, to the welcoming prayer. And then with centering prayer, you know, your, your sacred uh, word or image is, is not about um, the definition of the word that you use as a, as a way to let go. It's a way to, um, to find when we're becoming attached to, to thoughts and be aware of that and then kind of disrupt that pattern as a way to um, continue through um, however long you've, you've sat. So, um, you know, in scripture, surrender is, is the path to um, the um, ascension, the transformation and the ascension. Right. Mm. Like, so this idea of uh, just pouring, pouring out and, and being empty um, is something else that comes to mind here. But oh. that, that's kind of the, the path is we often think that giving up or uh, welcoming the heavy emotions is going to be the end of us. Like the, the crucifix, that's what's going to crucify us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's important to remember that that is not the end of the story. There's a period of, of darkness where something is only happening between the divine and Jesus that is unknown to us. And the next time we see him, he's unrecognizable. That you know, mm. we'll mistake him for um, the gardener. And um, so there's the transformation and the ascension that's also connected to our surrender. Ooh, good stuff. Good stuff. I think that's really beautiful. Like on many levels. So you gave us like a concrete meth method to maybe practice this the surrender via maybe centering prayer and welcoming prayer, which we'll definitely circle back to. And then, like if I can say, like a an archetypal or 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 
a um, uh, spiritual example um, via coming through the, the um, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus in, in, in the Bible, um, the New Testament, um, which is which is really cool. And would you say it's fair? I mean, I, I mean, we had another guest. I don't know if uh, you've ever uh, come across Bill Redfield before, uh, a contemplative guy. We'll have to c- c- connect you to if not. Um, but we had this co- conversation. He's doing a Lent uh, working, and this interview should be released in Lent. So I think it's just amazing uh, timing. Uh, it's really, really cool. Um, do you think it's something he said that really struck me? And I'm wondering if you think this is, it, it tracks with your experience. Um, so you're, you talked about like this really low point um, uh, um, related to addiction and abuse and kind of things kind of seemingly falling apart. Do you think that was a kind of crucifixion moment for you? Is it fair to apply that? Um, and, and then this emotional impact of that surrender sounded really nice and, and, and really great. So I was connecting that to like the, re- the resurrection almost or resurrection of your spirit. Uh, do you think it's fair? Do you think that was that, that experience um, was a kind of crucifixion and resurrection for you? Do you, do you think that's fair? I do think that's fair. And to the point where, it, and I, I don't say this lightly and I, you know, I take um, any suicidal ideations, you know, very seriously and encourage people um, to seek support if, if they are at that place. And I was at a place where not, not where I had like um, thought about how I would not be here anymore, but I did not want to be here anymore, mm. right? Um, so literally not wanting to uh, just continue on with the way that my life was going. And when I look about it now, and actually someone asked me a question um, a couple weeks ago that kind of tied into this, is is that moment um, of surrender, I, I believe it was a moment of coming to the end of myself, so to speak. So like all of the, the things that I wanted to change and Um, All of the negotiating that I was doing internally and externally of like, just to try to get my life to some place of like, being viable, you know, um, it was like, I had to let all of that go, all of the striving, all of the, you like anything that I was trying to um, control or fix, I, I had to let go. So I very much see it as like, an ending of myself. Now, that's not to say that now I don't still have, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I'm not some guru floating around, you know, that's like, it doesn't have these moments where I'm still aware that I'm trying to control things. Um, but what I am saying is that there, I am now reminded of like, when I get to that point, now I'm like, okay, well, this may be an opportunity to come to the end of myself again and trust you know, something that is, is uh, an intelligence that is uh, larger than, than me. Wow. Beautiful. That's really cool. As you're uh, um, kind of answering that, that question and reflecting on other questions folks have asked you about surrender, it's making me think this might be a good way to connect. You know, there's a lot of talks about like the, the meditation and ending or, or letting go of the ego or something like that, or, or, mm-hmm. or being less, being less selfish, something like that. I, I never really connected that to that surrender experience, but in that resurrection experiences, yeah, of course, we're still going to wash dishes and pay bills and everything, but <laughs> becoming less atta- attached to that. Um, and just accepting the radicality of, of how important that moment moment was, even though there's that paradox where it's very simple, but also very, very profound and poignant. Yeah. Um, yeah, good stuff. That's, that's, that's awesome. And I wonder um, if this, I definitely, I de- definitely want to ask, ask you to go, go into detail about centering prayer and welcoming prayer. Maybe before that, one thing we're concerned. So we talked a little bit about, uh, about this before I hit record. Um, is a lot of folks who are watching this, and, uh, who I'm in community with right now, are working with mental health or addiction and the dissolution of a way of life. Um, that, and, and sometimes maybe in a place of pain right now, or maybe rebuilding from a, a difficult experience. 
Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering on your path um, and the practices you're teaching, is there a, uh, do you think there's from your understanding a relationship between meditation or contemplative practice and what I would call like liberating change or, or sometimes people, sometimes people call it transformation or, or just uh, massive shifts from a way of being that was, we now recognize is kind of harmful or, or what, 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 what had a lot of suffering in it and, and kind of a, 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 a rebirth type moment. Do, do you see that? Um, have you seen that in your life? Do you see it with people practicing contemplative uh, uh, centering prayer or what are just some of your general thoughts on this idea of uh, liberating change? Mm -hmm. I, I do see, I can speak from, you know, my personal experience with um, liberating change and centering prayer um, and, and respond and say, yes, I, I would agree that there's a connection there. And I also want to, um, you know, reiterate like the, the um, our mental health or um, any traumas that, that we have been through. Like these are all things that um, may need to be supported in a variety of ways, right? So speaking to a mental health professional in conjunction with having some type of, um, of meditation or centering practice, you know, you wanna be supported holistically. Nice. Um, and when you're asking this question about change, I, I think that, that transformation is one of the fruits of centering prayer. So when, when we are talking about things like the ego um, or the false self is what you would hear it called in, in more um, Christian contemplative circles, that what, what is happening when, and many of us are not aware of this, is uh, when we come to this uh, silence, this however long it is, 20 minutes is what's recommended, um, there is a, a, a space for this divine therapy um, to take place. And Cynthia Bergeau, um, and, and of course, Father Thomas Keating um, talk about this a lot. And it's from my experience, it's like, um, it's not always pleasant, uh, <laughs> but it is like the release of an, an energy that we've been holding. And, and once that energy is released, it is like an ex experience of grace. And if I was to use my own, you know, terminology for it and how father thomas keating would explain it is that there is this um unloading of the of the unconscious that's that's taking mm. place so all of the things that we have suppressed and um not digested emotionally um now it's like your psyche is like okay well you know t is actually resting now She's not under any threat. This thing that she didn't allow herself to process at the time now has space to unload or evacuate. And the way that he describes it is that the moment that that um, happens, that that um, old undigested energy evacuates, that, that we receive spiritual energy, that, that there's, a, there's an energy exchange that takes place. So... Mm. um yeah <laughs> yeah amazing thank you thank you thank you so much for that that um that description of uh maybe the potential of li liberating change especially when we can look holistically um and it's a gift now we, we're gifted that we can have access to these amazing spiritual teachings and then some uh great psychotherapeutic stuff um and, and yeah peer groups and things that hopefully are accessible for folks um I did want to ask you, it's so fascinating about this. Uh, you, I, it was cool. You almost got into, I think you did get into the uh, mechanism almost of how this change could happen with, mm -hmm. uh, from a centering prayer paradigm. And I know Father Thomas Keating has really integrated a lot of amazing um, psychological and spiritual and like interval perspectives in his work, which is so cool to hear you, you describe that. I, I wanted to just at, tell, tell you this, first of all, because your work has been helpful for me on this, and then maybe we could introduce it to the, um, the audience as well. 
is you have on your website a really good intro to contemplation. So if folks would want to learn, like kind of parse more specifically what Tia was just saying, they could check that out. But I find yeah. found that very helpful in relationship to your work on intuition as well. Um, and so I see a, th a therapist and um, just to talk about how these things can work in conjunction. I feel that like sometimes when I talk to a therapist or talk to my peer group, it's the thought like the just kind of what's there in, in the mind. And sometimes I can feel to be honest that I'm just spinning a little bit, just kind of going mm -hmm. in circles. And your work on intuition and also centering prayer, there is something about it that I don't, uh, you talked about unloading the unconscious, but it does seem like memories come up, like emotions, like I just feel and feeling a lot of grief and just going into to therapy, not, not with like knowing why I'm feeling grief, but just this more intuitive, like there is grief here right now, mm -hmm. um, has mm -hmm. been really, really ben beneficial uh, to, 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 to me per personally and others I've talked to as well. So I'm wondering if you would be willing to talk a little bit about the relationship between like contemplative practices and intuition. Um, what, how, what do you see as the connection there or, or, or like maybe you could describe what you mean by intuition as well could be helpful or just any thoughts on practice and intuition? Sure. So um, one of the other, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a benefit, I guess, <laughs> it is, uh, benefits of having a, a consistent centering prayer um, time is that you do begin to nourish your um, intuitive intellect. So we can think of intellect as like, um, if we were to put it in kind of categories, there's like your active intellect. So that's like, I'm aware that I'm looking at my computer screen, talking to you, I can hear the fish tank going in our room, the dog beneath, like, so everything that my, um, that my senses can pick up. This is part of our um, active knowing, our active intellect. And what we often um, kind of ignore or discount is that we also have this intuitive knowing, this intuitive intellect. And those are things that we don't know why we know them, we just know them. So if I, if I was to, um, you know, if you were to ask me like, Tia, like, what are the hard facts? Like, how do you know that? Mm. I couldn't like give you any evidence. It's just something um, that, that I know, right? And it's, 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 it is when you're talking about um, earlier, you were talking about how the heart connects us. It's more of a, it's, to me, it is more of a visceral knowing than a, a knowing with our mental capacities or in our mind so you know it's a feeling it's a it's an intuition <laughs> yeah. um, and so um when we come to this period of silence what i have experienced is that um the quieting of everything helps tune us into that intuitive intellect that maybe is like drowned out by the noise of our own mind, the world, the things around us. And I think a, a really important thing to mention here is that all that this requires, all that centering prayer is asking of us is to just be. So you don't have to like, work you don't have to effort at anything you don't have to you don't have to make healing happen and this is very difficult sometimes for us to intellectually comprehend because it's like what you just want me to be here yeah. <laughs> and i don't have to do anything like what what does that i don't even know what that looks like right um but in that being again we are connecting to are, are many ways of knowing things that are beyond just the mind. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm, I'm really trying personally to connect with the intuition. I think 
I don't want to blame the cultural, but I think there is like a cultural bias that at least I grew up, grew up in. It's like, you know, we want our engineers or whatever to be heavy in the intellect and, and that's how you fly a plane. And that is always like, in my experience, lifted above um, that, even though that for that particular, very discrete domain, like that's probably a useful mindset. Maybe it isn't for like how to relate to someone else or how to, to explore the suffering that I'm going through and really opening up to like, I don't actually need to know the evidence for this. This just feels right. This feels like what I, we need to connect with on right now. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. Just kind of, and it reminds me of that word you said, surrender, because, um, y- you know, just, it feels right. Let's, let's go for it. And mm-hmm. um, uh, that to me feels extremely liberating and maybe could ask you about this one just to kind of comment on it. As, so as I mentioned, many of us listening, we have kind of an interest in recovery, addiction recovery, or recovery from, from anything. Um, we've been doing a lot of meditation recently, and you hear a lot of interesting self things about the ego and the self, and is there a true self, a false self, a no self, um, all these selves that, that can exist. And we, someone asked the question the other day, like, what is being recovered, actually? Like, what are we recovering? What was lost and what is being recovered? And that really blew my mind, actually. I was like, that's a really good question. What am I trying to recover? And my kind of thing right now is reminding me of what what you're talking about, is I have to admit to you, I do feel a little bit of fear about trusting myself, Um, maybe because I have harmed myself in the past. And it can be difficult to, it has been difficult to differentiate self-destructive urges from the heart, a a longing of the heart or an intuitive knowing. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you have anything to say about that. I just have been trying to voice that more because to me now what's being recovered is my connection to the heart and mm-hmm. my connected to the connection to the intuition and being able to trust myself to make good choices or make choices that I think are in, in alignment with, with my, with my heart's desires. Um, yeah. I don't know. Have you seen any obstacles like that before in your practice or with, with others? And do you have any, um, do you have a perspective on how if someone's having that specific obstacle where there might be some fear about connecting with the intuition or just resting um, because of maybe past experiences or yeah, um, um, whatever it is. Um, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I so thank you for sharing that. And mm-hmm. I haven't thought about <laughs> I haven't <laughs> thought about what's being recovered, right? Yeah. Um, in the in the way that you presented it. Um, What I would say is that it's called a practice for a reason, Mm. right? So um, a lot of times we like, we just want to, we just want to get things from the beginning and like check the box, ace the test and then like move on. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about contemplative practices they're called practices for a reason and so that concern about um you know can i trust myself or somewhere where i i I don't necessarily want to go well this is why it's a practice because the, the the more we can return the the more we can learn what the language of our self sounds like, right? And, and um, becoming consciously aware of like, okay, you know, if I'm making this decision, maybe I'm making it because I wanna have a sense of belonging, or maybe I'm making it because it will make me feel safe and secure, or maybe I'm making it because I want to control something, which this is all language of the false self or the ego. And so just creating like that gap of awareness um, can be very beneficial to discern and to take time to to make decisions and choices. And then of course, like not beating yourself up if, Mm. if it's not like, you know, extending yourself a lot of grace and then saying, all right, all right, well, I guess I'll return return to the practice now and see what other information I can learn about myself. And the other thing that I would share, Brian, is that, you know, um, collectively and culturally, we're not taught to trust our intuition. Mm -hmm. Like, um, 
if you think about even looking at like younger younger children they kind of just move about in this like surrendered way in this like intuitive way and then at some point during development you know there may be language art is a big one that comes up right like if someone wants to be an artist well what is it in them that's calling them to create that way like what why do they want to be an artist where is that coming from and then society will say like you can't be an artist you'll the artists are starving right that's what we say they're starving artists yes so it's like okay well i can't trust myself to do this thing that i feel like i'm really supposed to do because i won't be able to eat so i guess i'll go be an attorney or you know not that anything is wrong with attorneys i just picked that randomly <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're often given messages that are counterintuitive to that intuitive trust that is already built within us. So that's another reason why we we come back to remembering like this is a practice. You know, there may be a condition in my life that has told me not to trust myself. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm going to begin to trust myself, that's going to take some time, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. So uh, first I was hearing, that's great. Like, yeah, in response to maybe this potential conflict or issue of, of trusting myself, it's a practice. And this, this practice gives us the capacity to maybe uh, see things a little more clearly, take a, take a little pause and, and differentiate things and maybe hopefully over time connect uh, with, with that, that, that intuitive knowing more. And then right. That was great to hear you talk about just kind of had some self-compassion. You know, it's like there's that and this word development uh, is, is interesting. Even even there and talking about the development, there's this subtle idea that, you know, we're getting getting better, um, getting better at things. And while maybe like with the lawyer example, lawyers are great. And to be a lawyer, you need very specific gifts and capacities around, you know, talk, clarity, intellect, linguistic ability, writing. Um, and that definitely has developed since since our childhood. But there are sometimes in that process maybe gifts and capacities that are not nurtured and 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 wither a little bit, like artistic abilities and and in, uh, more connected to that childhood surrender. Yeah. And we just need to realize that we can nurture that again. And you know, it's like being a kid again. You know, we're not going to be as yeah. It's it, uh, if we've neglected something, maybe it just needs to to grow. Um, and that's perfectly cool. We can recover it. Yeah, I love it. That's wonderful. That's great stuff. Um, yeah, I'm wondering. Okay, so I have a I have a quick question. Um, we've talked. You've been weaving in centering prayer and the welcoming prayer as well. Um, in um, folks listen, listening, have a plurality of different practices. I know there's some folks who practice centering prayer, but for folks who maybe aren't as familiar with it, um, could you keep, like parse it a little for, for us? Like, what what is centering prayer? Um, whether it's a description of the method or a little bit about its history or whatever, however you want to go into it. Um, what yeah. is Centering Prayer? So Centering Prayer is a, uh, I'll just describe it like this. So okay. um, it's a time where we move into solitude, uh, stillness, and silence. Um, the idea of being in, sol in silence, we can hear, in um, solitude, or I'm sorry, in stillness, we can then discern how to move. And in solitude, we are present to what's happening in our lives. So the flow of centering prayer is um, just really bringing yourself to a seat. Um, and then it's recommended that there are two centering prayer sessions a day, one in the morning and one in the evening. And it's recommended that they're 20 minutes each. Now, if someone's just beginning, that can sound really intimidating. And so even if you're in, you know, uh, silence for five minutes, fantastic. Like there's still benefits that are taking place. But it's really grounded in intention, mm. which makes it different from other forms of meditation which are a lot uh oftentimes focused on attention mm -hmm. so what are you know put your mind on this put your thoughts on this like return to the mantra so if you think of it as like 
uh, your, your mantra is something you're placing your awareness on over and over and over again. You're putting your attention on it. Centering prayer is uh, rooted in intention and the intention is to consent to God's action and presence within. And so one of the differences between um, maybe centering prayer and a, a um, form of meditation where you would use the mantra is that you actually don't um, engage with your sacred word, which I talked about a little bit earlier, your sacred word or your image, which is a symbol of your desire to return to your intention. So what that looks like in practice is if I come to a seat, close my eyes, right? Automatically what's gonna happen is thoughts are, my mind's not gonna shut off. So thoughts are gonna be passing. And in, in this context, thoughts are any mental um, images, memories, you, thoughts that you're actually having in your mind, but they're also like the sounds. So for example, um, our dog who is here, you know, and I said, I, I don't know if you can hear our dog. Like th that, that is a thought, like her, the sounds that she's making or a thought. And they're also, uh, thoughts are also any sensation mm -hmm. that we, we may be having in our bodies. So what Centering Prayer invites us to is when we notice that we have become attached to a thought during this quiet time, then you bring in your word as a way to let go and return to your intention. So um, it may look like, uh, you know, coming to sit down, being quiet, mind starts to go. And then I start thinking about the things I need to do after this conversation. I need to go to the grocery store. Okay, well, what will I get from the grocery store? okay, well, I probably want a mango. So now I've become attached to this <laughs> idea yeah. of going to the grocery store. And then that's when we would, we would bring the, the word in. I live by a train track. So oftentimes when I'm uh, in uh, centering prayer, I'll hear the train go by, like that, that's a thought. The, the thing to keep in mind, which is really, really important is that thoughts are normal. And as long as the stream of consciousness is just flowing, so if it's, I need to go to the store, I wonder um, what my dad is doing. Oh, the dog. So as long as it's like this stream that's flowing, there's actually no need to bring the word in. Mm. Oh, interesting. That's a pretty interesting di distinction. So we, so, okay. So just to make sure I've got this, so centering prayer like many different practices, there's kind of sit down. Uh, we want to be still, uh, still, quiet, and sol solitude as well. Those are three big components. Um, and there is a sacred word, um, which is quite, it might seem subtle, but I, in practice, it's, it's quite distinctive from a mantra for me, at least. And so um, it, we're not like repeating it over and over again, necessarily. We are almost using it as a symbol of recognizing we're attached to, to a, a, a thought. Is that, is that correct? Um, it's absolutely correct. So the sacred word is a symbol. So it should be uh, something that's like a, you know, easy, like a couple syllables, maybe one syllable. And it doesn't matter, like my word that I use is love. And it's not the meaning of love that matters. It's what it's representing during the practice, which is my consent to God's action and presence within. So the, the word is a symbol that returns you to your intention. Yeah, yeah. And then in, in practice, I love that. that that's really, really helpful. In, in practice for me, it's, it's very, it's, it's when, when I, it feels very, very nat natural um, sit, sitting kind of naturally, but I think an innovation or something that's very clever about it is, um, is that differentiation between getting attached to a thought and the, and I, I, I don't know if you agree with it. I think I've heard this, but some people have framed centering prayer as actually about the releasing of, of that thought, like really getting good at really releasing attachment from thoughts. Do you, do you kind of agree with that? Is that, that your experience? I, I do. And I, I would also say, um, 
you know, for especially today, because they're, they're, when we hear the word silent, there's very few pl places that are silent. Like, yeah. <laughs> even in my, right? Even in my own home, like the dog's doing the thing, the train's going to go by. Um, when I first started practicing centering prayer, my daughter was very young. And, um, and so she was always, you know, like knocking on the door or coming to sit beside me. And these can become things that are very frustrating when our practice, when we first begin our practice and these interruptions kind of present themselves. So I think for anyone who may be just beginning, it's so important to know that all of those things that we would label distractions are fall under the terminology or definition of thoughts. And so what helped me stay engaged, not to say I didn't get frustrated, but what helped me stick with the practice was someone sharing with me that no matter if you have to return to your word 500 times during 20 minutes, you can think of each of those returns as a return to God, as a return to the divine. Mm -hmm. And so to have it framed for me like that was like, okay, like the things can be going on around me. Um, and, and, and I can, I can keep returning to God. I can keep returning to my intention. Now that's not to say like, you know, neglect a child who needs a snack and, and you're like, don't, come, you know, <laughs> right. don't talk to me. I'm in silence, you know, that we don't want to do that, but um, mm -hmm. just giving some perspective for that. And now, so I, where I used to get very frustrated at the beginning when these things would come up, now it's like they're a part of the practice. Like I, the, and you know, you can feel frustration, like rise up in your body, like right. your body just kind of and now I don't have that same visceral, visceral reaction as I did when I first began the practice. Nice one, nice one. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. That's, 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 that's great. And yeah, this focusing on the, the, the release, I, it takes a lot of pressure, pressure off for me because it's like, that's, that, that's like more, it's like the quote unquote, the big stuff or like the, the, uh, the, resting in God, consenting to the divine's work in you. Like that's not, my job is just like out of the thoughts essentially. Like I don't have to generate this peak experience or anything or worry about not following the instructions correctly. Um, mm -hmm. So I found that in practice, like really how I can kind of have a tendency. I do like to experiment with different meditation methods and there are, there are times and places to do like really complicated visualizations and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And that's fun. Um, but centering prayer is really, uh, delicious and, and or it has been for me really kind of relaxing and 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 peaceful is a good word and peace is just a really nice thing <laughs> so yeah I, I'm, I'm grateful for the practice for uh, uh, having a lot of bringing peace into my life um and it's like i'm not having to do it i'm just releasing my thoughts mm -hmm. beautiful and i wanted to ask you i'm so glad you brought up the example of the you know of, of course if there's a crying baby or if life impinges on practice that it's probably not a, a, a spiritual to like say wait i look at the timer and i've got four minutes and 36 seconds left i'll be right with you probably help help that person um but that can be very fr frustrating especially uh for someone like me who has some control control stuff but i'm wondering how the relationship, I guess, between your centering prayer practice or centering prayer and like the application to every everyday everyday life, um, mm -hmm. and like the I, I, this is a loaded word, but like the morality of life, or just treating people kindly, or maybe being less reactive, or being able to hold space for others. Um, I'm really curious about the relation. Going back to right at the beginning when we were talking about fellowship and community, being with others, and you know, Centering Prayer is inviting us to spend 40 minutes, which is quite nice. I mean, if we can make that happen, I think that's it's such great self-care to have 40 minutes of relative silence a day. I mean, I that's something I definitely want to work towards. But I also just want to, you mentioned that thing about helping others, even if it impinges on your practice. I mean, that's an extreme example, but do you think this practice has been beneficial for your, uh, in, in your relating to others? Do you think it how does the um i'm curious like how letting go of thoughts and maybe um 
uh, being more present to conversations, it, what kind of benefits that's ha having on relating. Uh, do you think those things are related in any way? I, I do. And uh, um, you bring us to an important, uh, important thing to share is sometimes, you know, um, that feeling of peace that you described is elusive to us. Mm -hmm. And so when we come to, uh, when we come to centering prayer, it's anything but peaceful. It's five million thoughts racing through our mind. It's a child interrupting us. Uh, it's, you know, whatever the, whatever the thought may be that presents itself. And so um, this is a good opportunity to kind of cut through the illusion that when we do meditate that we're like floating off into like on a on cloud nine somewhere right it, um the fruits of the practice actually overflow into your everyday life mm. and so what you may experience as time goes by is the things that used to uh, cause a emotional or provoke an emotional reaction out of you um, don't really do that anymore. And so being aware of like, wow, you know, that person, like I just got cut off in traffic and that used to be something that would really throw me over the edge. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I just, I'm not reacting the same way that I would <laughs> historically, right? Nice. So, um, or even having, um, you know, they say that, um, what's the saying about our family? They know how to um, push our buttons because they're the ones who helped install them. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's it's a good one. Like, it's something yeah. like that. So like when that button gets pushed, not erupting in, you know, an emotional response, it's, there's, um, there's more, awareness there's more space and um it grounds me in a place where i can respond to what is happening in my life as opposed to react to what is happening in my life and so in that sense <clears throat> yes we come to 20 minutes of of centering prayer but our life is the actual spiritual practice like how are you engaging with others how are you showing up in the world like this is the practice what are you when you know you're coming and maybe there's a bunch of things swirling around in your mind and you're getting frustrated well what happens in your life when things are swirling around and you're getting frustrated how are you going to respond to those things you know so it definitely there's definitely a correlation and a relationship um, between the two Nice one. Nice one. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, yeah. And speaking of that life, I love what you said about life being a spiritual practice. I've been really enjoying, could uh, recommend your book on giving up uh, mediocrity. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm curious if you see a connection here, but maybe just uh, um, give my quick summary. Well, first of all, I'll say the thing that jumps out to me is just the overall arching thrust about kind of letting go of corporate work and enjoying sweets um, quite hit home quite um, poignantly for me because I'm recovering from a binge eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And after getting more into uh, a more stable place with that and less self-destructive place, mm -hmm. um, a lot of that energy flew right into work and like overworking and um, really kind of being obsessed, obsessed with that as, 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 a, as a way to cope with anxiety. And it was a little healthier, but ultimately not as healthy. So I loved this thing about returning to sweets and letting go of overwork and framing that as not being mediocre. Um, that to me was just so refreshing and I really, really enjoyed it. And do you, do you want to talk a little bit about what you remember from creating that book um, with some of the the, the the what the essence of it is maybe uh, with hopefully not too many spoilers and um and uh and then do you think it connects i mean maybe we could start with this do you think this connects with making life a spiritual practice is what first inspired me to ask this question um what do you think about all, all that yeah uh, thank you for, I never know who, who has the books. I wish you got like a little notification that said like, Brian, yeah. ordered your book. So <laughs> thank you 
Thank you for ordering it. Also, uh, you know, celebrating you in in recovery. Um, uh, So thank you for for sharing that. Um, So that book came from a place in my life where I had been let, I had, I had worked since I was like 17 years old, 16 years old and never had been let go from a job, never been fired. And I was at this uh, really, this crossroads in my life where I felt like I was being called to ministry and um, exploring like theology and all of these things, which was not making any sense because I had like this very corporate background. And so um, I got let go from my job. Mm -hmm. And so, Uh, what I decided was I knew I had enough savings that we would be okay for at least for 40 days, right? Like we, we could make it maybe two months, right. Um, With what I had. And so I thought, okay, I am not going to look for another job like I would traditionally have Uh, because the truth is like, I didn't want to get up out of bed and go to that job. (laughs) <laughs> half the days I was getting up and going yeah. to it right and that's probably like someone else may have loved to have that job or take someone else's space at, that where they would want to be there um so what I decided was okay for 40 days I'm only going to do work that I love and so the book is really like my self-talk mm-hmm. during that time like I just started making notes in my phone and turned it into a book and and because I was not right because I wasn't raised in a religious environment that observed Lent or gave up anything my awareness and understanding at the time always associated like you know people were giving up chocolate or they were giving up which I understand I do understand it. And I was like, I'm giving up mediocrity. Like Mm -hmm. I am going to pour myself into the things that I'm passionate about. I'm going to be excited to get out of my bed in the morning and I'm going to see what happens 40 days later. And Mm -hmm. so that's, that's where that came from. Beautiful. And I was also scared to death that I was going to go broke. So I was like, okay, maybe if I can sell a couple (laughs) books, I can pay the mortgage. Yeah. That's the truth, you know. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like well, desperate times will will lead to a lot of creativity. <laughs> mm, absolutely, I, and it's something that just really comes through. I'm really glad we had this conversation after reading it because it makes a lot more sense now. There's something about it, and it reminds me of what you were talking about earlier with s- surrender as well, and like giving up mediocrity. Um, and I would really suggest people read it because it's such an interesting word just to explore the relationship I have to mediocrity. But this idea of giving, because some culturally we might say that kind of following this kind of, I'm going to write a book and we'll just see if it pays the mortgage versus going to just kind of sucking it up and like, wake up, I'd hate this job and I'm going to wake up and do it. Um, we could get a cultural message that actually the lad, the, the, the former is the mediocre thing, right? Uh, uh, getting up and kind of suffering through it is, is mm-hmm. exceptional. But really, I mean, you feel in the book that you're giving it your all. You know, there's something, we've all been there doing a job where you're just not, it doesn't, can't get, and there's usually good reasons for it. Like maybe it's not ethical, it's not resonating on some kind of ethical level, yeah. or we all have to do things that maybe we're not fully invested in. And this book mm-hmm. just really, you can feel it. Like um, even in, it's it's somewhat biographical, um, but it, you just feel this resonance of uh, there's a passion here, which is just a, a word, word that I really like. And speaking of that, um, hopefully this isn't too much of a jarring segue, but I really really want to uh, talk about the the, the mystics. Um, and so you you are coming out of this corporate job, you write this book, and now you're doing all kinds of amazing things. Um, and one thing is. And it reminds me if you had a kind of a dream, a, like a dream of getting into ministry or doing theology, maybe. And now you are, are, are doing this interview series uh, about mystics or uh, meeting the mystics, is it, is it called? Is that it? 
Yes, thank you for bringing that up and for asking. So yeah. one of the things that we're exploring, um, I have the honor of serving as a pastor for a community called okay. Awakening Movement. Okay. And so we're in a, we started a series at the beginning of the year that is exploring the spiritual journey, contemplative practices, and everyday life. And so part of that series includes a segment of interviews in which we will speak to modern day contemplatives and they'll share with us a mystic who um, they see as a teacher and is influencing their life and how they show up today. So I'm very excited about it. Um, <clears throat> a gentleman named Cameron Johnson based out of Atlanta is our, our first interview um, nice and it's one. designed to have, it is designed in a way that we will speak to or hear from at least one person uh, once a month. So Ooh. ideally at the end of the year, uh, we've either been introduced or reintroduced to um, people that could be classified as, as mystics. Nice one, nice one. I'll make sure folks have the availability to that when this goes out. Uh, but I'm curious for you in the mean, meantime, are there are you willing to share a mystic that has made an impact on you um, with us? Maybe we could, we could explore. Um, is there any, anyone in particular that comes up? Thank you for asking. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm still, um, I am still being introduced to the mystics my, myself. Um, if I had to share a, a couple today, I, I consider Father Thomas Keating a mystic. Cool. And he deeply <laughs> influences like what I'm doing vocationally and how I show up in the world. Um, but someone and someone else who I kind of have developed a, a curiosity about is uh, St. Teresa of Avila. Mm. Um, and so I actually have a, like a little framed picture of her in my room. So. Oh. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Um, and, and she's one who, like, I'm still trying to make my way through, um, through her book, um, which the name of it escapes me now, where, she, where she's describing um, the spiritual journey as like being in mansions. Um, Is it the interior castle? Is that? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm a big fan as well. I, I have a real affinity of, with the Carmelite folks. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, I love that. And um, there, uh, I read her, I'm trying to remember the name of it. I'm forgetting this one, maybe not, but I'll put it in the description, uh, both the interior castle. But it's one where she's writing, um, like kind of an autobiography type thing. But um, she's really funny. I just really, I just really enjoyed reading, reading her. She's, she's quite quite, quite funny and self-depreciating and uh, witty. Yeah. And, that, and uh, obviously a, sp a great spiritual master and teacher. And so yeah. we will definitely have to uh, talk to someone about Teresa Davila or, or as For you learn sure. more, maybe we'll bring you back on to uh, talk to <laughs> yes. us about her. Cool. Yeah. And I've learned a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot. That's an exaggeration. I'm learning quite a bit about um, Dr. Howard Thurman, who is hmm. more of a, you know, a, a mystic of, of, more recent times than um, St. Teresa of Avila, learning a lot about, um, there I go saying a lot, and it's not a lot, <laughs> but learning about how he, how he grew up and his experience um, has been really fascinating to me. So there's three awesome. mystics. Yeah, that'll keep us, keep us busy until I am, uh, as we're waiting for the Meet the Mystics to drop. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah good, one. Go. good one, good um, <laughs> one. Um, Tia, you've been extremely generous with your time. Uh, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I'm wondering if you have space for one more question. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So we have talked about some of your amazing offerings, your books, some ways um, that your uh, offerings you're sharing with the world. If we wanted to learn more about uh, getting involved with your group or reading your books or just kind of following, following you um, online, um, wh wh what's the best, where can we go? Yeah, so um, my website is probably a good starting place, Okay. Um, which is uh, contemplatehouston.com. Uh, you could also navigate there by 
you could just look up look up my name Tia Norman. Um, that sounds so fancy. You could just look me. <laughs> you yeah. just look me up. But yeah, contemplate. Like uh, what I was going to say is it's also tiaarianne.com, which is my first name and middle name. Um, that's a good place. Uh, I kind of lean on the social media side. I kind of lean more towards Instagram than other platforms. And my username on Instagram is to be Tia. Um, but the website will have like, there's a meditation you can download. There's a, there's a link somewhere to a, a article I wrote on an introduction to contemplation. I think it's mm-hmm. on the website. If not, it's in my Instagram bio, but those are the best uh, places. And then the community that I pastor is called the Awakenings Movement, which is also on Instagram and Fan- Facebook. Fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So we will link up your Instagram and website. Um, if folks are interested in checking it out, please do. And Tia, I just want to say um, thank you so much for what you're offering the world and offering us. Appreciate uh, learning your wisdom and hearing a bit about your experience. So thanks so much yeah, for being here. Thanks for the invite, and I of celebrate course. your work. And, thank and you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too.